Hello YouTube, I'm Nye from Finale Guitar in Sheffield and you're watching Folk Friend, your one-stop shop for Celtic backing guitar tutorials. A few months ago I released a book called Irish Tunes for Fingerstyle Guitar which contains 10 of my arrangements of um, Irish tunes and they kind of range from fairly easy, suitable for beginners up to near the end, lots of jazzy chords, um, really quite technical. Um, but you can check that out in the card in the corner of the screen if you'd like to have a look at some of my arrangements. And in order to celebrate that, I ran a little competition to try and encourage beginners to get involved and write their own arrangements as well. One person who entered was certainly not a beginner. Uh, his name was Jordan Lively, and he actually, as it turns out, had previously won um, Belfast Guitar Festival's Young Guitarist of the Year Award for his Irish fingerstyle playing. And uh, having had a look at some of his other arrangements, I thought it might be nice to um, interview him about how he writes those arrangements, um, the tunings he uses, the techniques, and those kind of things. And it turns out he was actually taught by Tony McManus as well. And so we had a good little chat about um, some other interesting uh, guitar styles on show by Tony and some other famous players. So what I've done in this video is I've got a whole, um, it's about two and a half hours long, the complete clip. I've edited out a few little bits and I've pretty much put up the whole thing. <laughs> so there's loads of great stuff in there, um, loads of useful dad gad tips, some stuff about other tunings, some interesting techniques you can use, how Jordan goes about writing his arrangements, and we've also analysed one of those which is called Whelan's Old Sow. If you look in the box below you can find links to everything that we talk about including um, some people he's collaborated with, um, a few albums by uh, Tony and others that we've mentioned and stuff like that. And uh, you can also hit the subscribe button while you're down there and get a free Folky tutorial every Thursday evening along with my weekly live stream Folky Fridays. That's it from me then, without further ado, let's get into the interview. <laughs> just tell us a bit about your musical background and who you are and everything before we uh, get into arranging. Of course, yeah. So um, I'm Jordan Lively. I'm a, a fingerstyle guitarist slash trad guitarist from County Down in Northern Ireland. And um, yeah, I just sort of sit and arrange tunes all day and then put them up on YouTube is sort of the gist of it. I, uh, <laughs> I'm a guitar teacher in inverted commas um, up around here teaching beginners and stuff like that there. And uh, I sort of, I try and get them into traditional music as best as we can. So, yeah. uh, I got into the style um, from listening to the music of Tony McManus. Um, I wasn't in the, I wasn't really in traditional music from a young age, which you would find, you know, you would find the most traditional musicians have been in it all their life. I only got into it when I was about 15, 16 through the score, and that was through singing. It wasn't through the, the instrumental music or anything. Oh, all right guitar teacher in the school, um, another great fingerstyle guitarist called Mickey Murphy. And he introduced me to the, this music by Tony McManus. And you know, I played through it first of all, and was like, oh no, this is too hard. I'm not bothering with this. And then let it sit for about three months. And then I was bored one day during summer, and I saw it, and it was, you know, I was starting A-level music and was trying to get more serious in the performance and playing and practicing. So I thought, you know, I'll just, I'll sit down, I'll, I'll bat it through it, and I'll just, you know, I'll get it learnt. Um, purely for the practice more than anything. And then, you know, you start playing it and you start listening to it and you realise, oh, I actually quite like this. And then I started looking into Tony's albums and I started listening to his albums and was just mesmerised. I mean, there's, there's, I don't think there is a better uh, traditional guitarist out there than Tony McManus, which if he um, 
Tony teaches me as well, thank God. Um, him and Mickey were uh, very good mates and still are, hopefully. And um, I played one of his pieces. Uh, we met me of some of his pieces for my AS performance in 60. Um, hmm. Mickey Murphy was um, cheeky enough to send Tony a video and say, Tony, is the, have you got any advice on sort of what to, what to do with this here fella? And Tony very kindly offered up a lesson for me that day. Um, and sort of since then, it's been about you know, about two or three years now. I've sort of been I've been working or uh, been being taught by Tony, um, sort of how all this finger style stuff works. And then now we're here today. We're sitting in an office <laughs> an interview with you. <laughs> so I think we're gonna we're gonna take a look at a jig that I've arranged um, called Wheelin's Old So uh, This is a tune that I got off fantastic harp album, um, which the name of it is in Irish, so I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of it, but I think it's called Sunus or, or Sunus or something, but it's by Michelle Mutahi, who is just amazing, just absolutely fantastic. And I, I was working with a harpist from here, of another fantastic harpist called Catherine McGee, check her out on Facebook, and um, we recorded the set of tunes together. Um, so um, it's the last tune in the set, it goes O'Sullivan's March, into Celia's Jig, which Michelle Mulcahy wrote herself, as far as I know, and then into Whelan's Old Side. So we'll be covering that and sort of going over a few of the techniques I used to arrange, a few of the sort of philosophy bits I used to sort of decide where, which frets are going where and all that there. All right, wicked. What tune are you in there for this, uh, this arrangement? So, yeah, so for, um, for, this tu- uh, for this set, I play it in Dad Gat, um, purely, oh, okay. purely because it's in D. And it's not really got that high of a range between the notes, you know what I mean? There's no high Ds or high C sharps or anything in it. Um, yeah. Whenever well, do, do you generally use uh, dad gad or uh, an open tuning or are you? Um, yeah, so for accompaniment, um, so whenever I'm sitting accompanying tunes in a session or something, I usually be in dad gad. No, not usually, I'll always be in dad gad. Um, for songs, I switch between dad gad and open G and open D an awful lot. Um, I've, Paul Brady, um, the man himself, would have used an awful lot of open D and open G, and I sort of learned, um, sitting and learning his songs back in the day, and I would have got a lot of techniques from him. But for tunes, the, there's about four tunes that you sort of jump across. Um, so the first of all is Dad Gad, which is very versatile and very, very handy. And you, if you put enough effort in it, you can probably play any tune you want on it, you know, regardless of the key. But if you want to make life easier for yourself, you can use the other ones. So there's one called C sus two, which is C G C G C D, um, which mm-hmm. which is good for tunes in D that have a high um, a larger range to them. So um, uh. Mick O'Connor's and Lado Burns have high Bs in them, as far as I know. Um, and it's just yeah. lovely to have that there, sort of on the seventh fret or the fifth fret or whatever. You know, those higher notes are within your grasp. Um, yeah. Then there is uh, G sus G sus four, which is basically dad dad except moved up a string. So um, it's C G D G C D something like that. Um, and then there's bag type in as well which is, is something that Dick Gohan, if I remember what Tony told me right, I think Dick Gohan, the Scottish, um, the Scottish uh, guitarist, uh, came up with it, which is D-A-A-E-A-E or something like that. I can't remember. I, I sort of do it now. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Oh, I've, never seen, I've never seen that one or heard of it even. Like. Yeah, it's great. I think he... Um, I think on Dick Dahan's album, Coppers and Brass, he, uh, it was Alec, it's Alan McCurson of Mosspark or something like that. There's a set of tunes anyway, of, of bagpipe tunes, and I think he uses that tune. It's, it's very cool. Oh, cool. Tricky. I'll have to look into that. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's really good. It's really cool. Um, mm. Just as well, I'm just thinking about the people watching. You're probably going, how in God's name do you remember how to play in all these different tunings? And, you know, yeah, you just go. certainly something that happens to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and really, it's sort of looking at the relationship between all of them. So if we just start in Dad Gad, yeah, which is the one that I would be most used to, um, for playing in that there, sort of the G-sus-4 tuning, um, it's 
basically like you've taken all of your strings and then just shifted them up a place. So instead of your low D being on the bottom string here, it will be on um, at the fifth string position, okay? And then from there, it's just the same. And then you have, a, you, sort of, you have your low sort of number four note on the bottom. It sounds very confusing. It takes a wee while to get into it. But once you start seeing these here relationships, it makes arranging tunes yourself far easier. Mm. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's it about tuning. So that's a really important. It's, it's very important to sort of consider what tuning that you're in whenever you start arranging these here. I can't, yeah, definitely. I can't tell you the amount of times that I've started an arrangement and gotten to the B section or the C section and gone, nope, not working. And then just stick the guitar into an attitude and then just write back. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. I find often with, uh, with tune arrangements, because the B parts are always so much higher than the A parts, um, I've, I've come unstuck with that before. When you start out with something and then you end up, you get to the B part and suddenly you're like, I can't play these notes. You, know? yeah. <laughs> you end up trying to pitch the B part down an octave or something. Or Yeah, I know. I would say I, I would say that it's good advice to sort of look at the B part before you start arranging the A part, but I can't really give that because I never do it myself and always end up in the same predicament. <laughs> well. Yeah. Um, do you have like a, a sort of formula for arranging then, or do you have any particular sort of harmonic approach or...? Yeah, so um, I suppose the first thing to start off with is to think about what's the most important part of any traditional tune. Um, is it the accompaniment for it or is it the melody? And 99 times out of 100, it would be people care about the melody more than they actually care about the accompaniment. Artie McGlynn put it best in his, uh, there was a documentary about it on TG Cahar, and uh, I think he put it best and he said something to the gist of nobody cares about the guitar. Um, which is a great philosophy to stand behind. So it is. <laughs> Try so whenever you listen to guitarists, it's not true. <laughs> uh, so whenever you're arranging a tune, think more about the melody. You can stick in all your fancy, you know, your 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 flat sevens and all your fancy uh, accompaniment bits afterwards. But try your best to get the melody to stick out. And even then, if, um, uh, of course, we know that traditional music is very ornamented. So you have your triplets, you have your, your, your rolls, you have your cuts and all that there. Just play through the melody sort of nice and dry, first of all. Just get your notes and, um, and then start worrying about how you can ornament it or how you can do bits and pieces. After a while, as you start arranging more tunes, you'll see, all right, that bit, a triplet will definitely work here or a cut will definitely work here. And you'll start popping them in a bit earlier than you would um, beforehand, but it comes with practice and it comes with time. Just when you're talking about the, uh, the cuts and rolls and triplets, um, how, do you, how do you do a cut on a guitar? Um, it's just, it's like an acciaccatura, wouldn't it be? It would be, it's really, oh, okay, yeah. really, really fast pull off is all of this. Um, I don't know, I can't remember if there's any in this year tune that we're going to do, but um, <laughs> I'm sure you'll find one on my YouTube channel. Um, yeah. So the thing after that then is that we've got the melody. Um, with with you know we've sat and listened to it and then written it out in the stave or something. Um, or we've got the notes for it online. How do we then translate that into guitar? Um, and the big thing is to just keep it as handy as you physically can. Um, whenever you're playing traditional music, it is at speed. It is going to be fast and you don't want to be doing any massive bars or you don't want to be doing anything overly complicated. Um, Speak for yourself, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love whenever it. Whenever I... Uh, <laughs> sort of masochism, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something to do with that. Um, but, you know, make life easy for yourself. Um, and one of the things that I think... Um, one of the ways that I sort of try and make it easy for myself is to play across the strings usually rather than playing um, just a, a regular scale um, up the strings, okay? Um, what is the difference between these two things? So whenever we're playing in standard tuning, um, you know, whenever you're playing a scale, it'll go like... Something like that, all right? Um, and you're, you're playing up and down the strings, and that's 100%. But in that gap, because of the way the intervals are played out, you can do something really cool, which is this here. Just 
So yeah, so this it is all the scale is is a D major scale. But instead of playing it like this, where we're going D, C sharp, D, A, G, F sharp, E, D. Instead of playing it like that, where we're playing, I'm going to say, along the string, we're, then, we're instead playing it across the strings, where we're going D, C sharp, G, A, G, F sharp, E, D. Okay? So you're kind of, you're jumping um, one string over on a fretted note, then an open string, then one string over on a fretted note, then back to an open string, that kind of... Yeah, that's, that's the gist of it. The, the main thing behind it is that you don't want to play a string twice in a row. So you never want to be going, you know, the D, there we played the A string twice in a row. We don't want that to happen. We want to be going. Okay. Mm, that's great. That's a really, really useful tip, that. Uh, yeah, and sort of just, just to plug another one of my areas, it's, there's a, a hornpipe called the Independence Hornpipe. Uh, I don't know if you know it, do you? Um, um the, I know the tune. I have, yeah, I've heard the tune. Yeah, the, and it's it's a bit natural, isn't it? Like it it is all scales, and it is really it just it just does the end, especially the second part of it. But mm. I have an arrangement of it, and you can get a really good effect just by using that scale. There's a, there's a problem about that, but you know, I would never dream of trying to play that there along the string as a regular scale. But like that, yeah. it ends up not being that 100 percent tricky, you know. Um, there's times where this is really useful, and then there's times you sort of go, "All right, I'm not going to be doing a stress like this here to get from an F sharp to an E. I'm just going to go F sharp to an E like this." But then mm. there are times where you're going, "I have to go from an A to a C sharp," but. I don't, it's just awkward to get that there and it doesn't protect you sound nice. So instead, let's do something like this. You're playing like that there. Mm. Okay. Um, this, um, having this knowledge in your head about, okay, I can play a note, not here, I can play it in a different string and this will, this will give me a nicer tone, it'll give me a nicer sound. Um, it's great. And it also, it makes your guitar playing a bit harp like, if you know what it means. You know, on, on the harp, if you play, you know, of course, on the harp, there's no, there's no frets, there's no like keys, or there's no dampeners around, and it's just all the strings that after each other. And if you play a scale on the harp, it'll be going, you know, it'll all be ringing out. Um, it's all the ringing notes, yeah. Yeah, the same thing happens. In that's a real good, good thing about dadgad that you really can't get very much in standard as well, isn't it? There's only a few yeah. keys that standard really lends itself to for that kind of ringing notes thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, um, Course, but, um, <laughs> yeah, and also just for people, then um, I have the cap on the first fret because I just like playing an E flat because I'm a bit awkward like that. So um, <laughs> uh, if you if you're looking to play along with them, the video, just cap on the first fret, do the job. So um, play through the melody, keep it as simple as possible. Think about playing across the strings rather than playing just uh, along the string. I'll say, um, and then ornament afterwards. Think about how to make the melody pretty. Think about your variations after you've got the bare bones of it down onto the guitar. Okay? So, um, before we'll go on, um, after, at this point, you then start adding uh, your accompaniment bits to it and your harmony bits. Um, I'll just play through. Um, I'll just play through the ones outside. I'll play through the first part of it just. And um, then we'll sort of take a wee look into what I've done there and uh, we'll see how we can put this into our context, okay? If I mess this up, you can edit it out. If I mess this up, you can edit it out, and then... Uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> oh, mate, uh, I thank God for jump cuts, like... <laughs> <laughs> Every time I accidentally say some ridiculous, stupid thing, I'm like, oh, yes, the editing will be... Uh, uh. So that's the A section, okay? Um, let's now take a wee look in the, the ornaments and stuff that I've used. So start off, um, whenever you're talking about a compliment, you usually, like, whenever we're talking about the basses and how to sort of put our bass strings into it and how to put that accompaniment aspect into our guitar playing, try and accompany the tune yourself before thinking about the bass string stuff. So if I were to accompany Wayland's old style, it would go something like this here. 
And you can see there that now that you've sort of done the accompaniment, your your bass notes are laid out for you already. Excuse the often mm. there, E flat is not a key that is suited for my voice at all. But um, once you've done, once you sort of, uh, once you've done the accompaniment, like you know that there's going to be a G here, so you know that you have to fit the melody around the same G note. You know that in what bar is it? Uh, you know that there's going to be some sort of descending thing happening in bar seven. So you're going to go, all right, I know what the chords are. Let's just follow the chords and fit the melody around it. Makes life a lot yeah. for yourself because you're yeah. not. For for people that are that are watching this, um, trying to work out uh, some of the shapes there, that's that little G down to E minor run that you were just talking about. That is the G to E minor link from uh, my dad gab video. You can yeah. you can find that there if you want the the chord shapes for that. Yeah, yeah, and you I'll know, link it in the card as well. Be in the corner of the screen. Good stuff. Um, and again, like that's not um, it might look complicated, but in reality, if you sort of sit down and write out the chords. All that's following really is just one, four, five. You know, it's just our one. Have you? I don't know if you've gone over like chord numberings or anything on the channel yet. Absolutely, you? yeah, yeah. One, four, well, five is the progression of kings. <laughs> yeah, that's the you know, ninety-nine percent of professional music is just just follows the same thing, you know. Um, and that's all. Yeah. It is. You know, it, um, when you boil it down, it is. It's. Uh, I'll, I'll not say simple, but it's not complicated. Okay. Mm. So, um. Now let's sort of get into the more complicated stuff, which is how do we ornament it in a way that is suited to the guitar. And by this, I'm not really talking about trills and cuts and stuff like that, but I'm talking about um, percussive use of the strings in the guitar, which we'll get a wee bit more into now in a bit, um, sort of frailing um, and sort of slapping the string and tapping. So, excuse me, whenever Whenever you see fingerstyle guitarists talk about um, percussion in the guitar, they usually think something around Addie McKee or sort of the um, that crowd of people that like Candy Rap Records has, where they're tapping the guitar and they, you know they're doing all of their nonsense. I find it this <laughs> sounds bad. I find it very technically um, proficient, but I wouldn't stick it in traditional music. Um, we'll leave it at that. Um, but you can still get an aspect of this sort of percussion thing in a way that is unique to the guitar that sort of other instruments and trad can't really do. So if we will just go through this here, I'll play through this slowly and I'll stop when I get to them. So there we're talking about this tapping thing. So the way the melody goes is something like this. Okay. And there we have um, sort of a repetition of notes which is something as well to look out for in the melody, where we have like an open D string playing like three times in a row. See that? Mm -hmm. So, um, we are, whenever we play this here, let's think about how we can sort of vary that up so that we're not just doing, we can stick a triplet there. Do something like that. Um, we could play. Uh, this is this is the bit that I really want to uh, um, <laughs> steal from you because because <laughs> your your triplets are really cool and uh, I've not really seen I've not seen many players actually using those kind of finger pick triplets. Thank you. Um, yeah, in that kind of way, I mean, there's a few like Tony McManus. Obviously, is is does a lot of that kind of thing. Um, yeah. But uh, it doesn't come up very much. So, could you just run people through how you're actually doing those? Definitely. So, uh, finger style, the, these chapters are something that, like, whenever you explain it, it sounds easy enough, and then you sit down and practice it, and you're like, oh, God, why did I ever decide to play this style of music? Um, so, all it is is literally just, you're just picking the string with these three fingers, except you're doing it quite fast. So, if you slow it way down, the motion of it is... I'm sorry about the camera, I know that the, the lighting is less than, less than pleasing, but... Um, it's this is just ring, middle, index. Ring, middle, index. And then when you get that up to speed, you just you take it to a metronome, just do it a wee bit faster and faster in increments, and you can then get it to. Okay? 
Do you want to give that a go there, Nate? Um. Yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's, it's. Yeah, um, it's easier to start up on the top string. Okay, so see in this, this, this here. The, um, or uh, are you in Dad Gad or are you in Star? You know actually, I'll I'll tune down to Dad Gad as well. So we. Uh, Oh, of course you're in. Oh, I'm not in um, I I'll take the capo off. I've got a capo here actually, so I can steal that oh. off. Oh, do that. Right. Yeah, and that's isn't the it kind of slant so that your nails don't dig under the string isn't it that's the yeah so this is this is another thing but we're which is getting a wee bit into the more technical side of this your style of music but um the if you look at guitars playing and this is this is me being young and stupid and talking about stuff that i probably don't know an awful lot about but i'll talk about it anyway uh, sometimes you see the finger style guitars that play traditional music and their hand is like this here yeah, and mm. it, that, it's a very classical, you know, classical guitar position, and it's 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 a good, you know, it's good standard technique to do it. But now they do the triplets, we get a sound like this. I don't know if it'll come up in the mic, but yeah, they're cut. You can hear the nail, can't you? So something that I picked up because I used to play like this as well, and um, until I sort of naturally slanted it like this. Tony plays with this, with this bit of his hand. Oh, well, is it rude to the bridge? I don't know. But he plays like this here. And whenever you see him play, his hand position will be like this here. Okay? Mm. Tony's completely self-taught, so this is just this is what worked out for him. And it means that whenever we're playing our, you know, whenever we're playing our triplets, we don't get that nail sound. We can get this here. And I, I, I'd, I'd show my nails to the camera for crack, but... Um, Oh, I don't know if that would come up, but you can sort of see the outline of shape anyway. They're slanted this way. Oh, yeah. Um, which just, I, this is just through trial and error on my part, is I find is the handiest way to get a decent tone out of it for this. Now, there oh, are, yeah, you know, there are benefits and drawbacks, as with anything, to using this technique. You know, um, you might get a cleaner triplet easier um, when playing like this, but whenever you go down to the bass strings, you can get a bit of a, you can get a bit of a, you can get a bit of a thing going on. Um, which uh, Tony works the way around by doing triplets with his thumb. However, I just could not figure it out for love and money, so I just, I just grip my teeth and <laughs> do the triplets um, on the bottom strings. Um, I suppose <laughs> if you got flat lines or something like that, there you could, you could. Um, do that there, but we'll not get talking. Yeah. About it. Then we'll, uh, we'll if you've got thirty quid for a set of strings, like then. <laughs> yeah, we may as well stick them on. But uh, where were we? So we're talking about this D thing, um, and we said, right, okay. So if they play a D three times in a row, um, how do we how do we make it so that it's not as boring? Um, so we can do the triplet like you just did there now. We can do something like this, where we also have a D at the fifth fret on the A string. So we can do something like this. And we're getting a sort of a harp effect out of it because we're letting the string fling out over each other and it can sound quite cool. We mm. can stand on this and say, right, let's add a wee bit of pizzazz to that. And that's instead of playing the thing like this, let's tap the string and go like. So there's a difference between those notes. And you can, you know, you can hear the difference and that's something that sticks out. Um, especially because in the context of this here tune, it's on beat five of the bar. So it's, you're sort of emphasizing something that is, that shouldn't be emphasized. So it gives a wee bit of a syncopated feel to it. Or syncopated is the wrong word, but you know what I mean. It's putting an accent yeah. that really shouldn't be, which gives a good effect. Now, the other great benefit with that is you, you, you're kind of missing out. You don't have to pluck a beat, do you? So your, your right yeah. hand doesn't have to do as much work, you know? Exactly, and this is this is something that I do an awful lot. You know, this is talking about this efficiency, um, which I was getting into earlier on. Because we're playing so fast, um, a lot of stuff. That, like whenever you look at a video of me playing, an awful lot of this hand be moving, and uh, relatively not as much as this hand will be moving. And that's because mm. of the happen stuff. And you know, if you can get a note to sound without having to pluck it, 
go for it, like, because um, that'll just it'll yeah. work far easier for you. Okay. Now, this is this is a wee bit more advanced and takes a wee bit of time to sort of realize what when you can do it and when you can't. But we can also miss out a note of the melody if it's not important in the verdict comes. Okay. So yeah. if we're playing three Ds in a row. It's not really added, and if we forget the last D or play the second D as a, a crotchet or whatever instead of quaver, um, or for our American listeners, uh, was it a quarter note instead of a half note, something like that? Uh, it's quarter notes, the crotchets, yeah, and eighth notes. Yeah, eighth, eighth. yeah, sorry. So we're playing a, a quarter note instead of an eighth note. Um, we can just, you know, we miss it out, which is what I do with the song. I go like this. Instead of playing this third D, I play the bass note with G. Okay? Um, which, when you put up the speed sense, I guess. You know, you get this here percussive thing happening. And then whatever the rest of it goes like. Okay? Oh, that's cool. and this, uh, yeah, so this is like, this is how you're adding, you're adding variation to it. So we're not just getting something that's just going like. Or something like that. Okay, mm. we're just playing a D string on its own, but we're not really doing anything to emphasize it. And you know, like this doesn't just apply to trad. This is like in music. Like I remember going to a singing teacher. I, I did classical singing for a long time. And if there was uh, like if there was a bar where there was you know if it was like a semi brief um, for four bars or something like that, there you don't just sing that note at the same dynamic. Um, and just hold it like that there throughout, you know, four whole bars. You have to, you mess with it yeah. and stuff on it. And this is the same sort of just here. Don't just play an open D string three times, you know, make it a wee bit interesting for the listener. Okay. Yeah. Just so, going back to what you said before about um, the, the hammer-ons there. One thing, one thing that I noticed when I was trying to um, write arrangements of jigs was that to get the rhythm kind of smooth flowing, the way that jig kind of goes lump bum bum lump bum bum lump bum bum it kind of, yeah. um, it's got that sort of very definite one and three, but mm -hmm. the two and the, uh, one and four, sorry, you know, the first and fourth yeah, 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 like the, yeah. the common ones and the others are just kind of yeah, sucking it into them a little bit. Yeah. But uh, I always find like plucking the one and the three was important, but hammering on the other two was usually preferable to keep the rhythm kind of, feeling smooth I don't know if that's because that seems to be kind of what you're doing in that little section that you just played as well yeah well let let me think about this for a wee moment if we're so uh, let's say I'm a company in a tune let's let's go back to this here just to go over this here sort of one and four sort of thing and again this is just me personally you know this is just my opinion uh, give that as much value as you will um if I was a company in that tune, I whenever I'm a company in general, I try not to just have one, one, four, one, four, one, four happening. I try to sort of mix it up a wee bit. Um, yeah. I'm try emphasizing all chord changes. So something like this here. Stuff. Yeah, it did. Yeah, it's not, doing just, uh, yeah, it's not just on one and three. three. Yeah, um, add these three changes does add an awful lot of movement to it because um, I know that I know that whenever I sort of started out, whenever I was sort of doing starting out in this year as well, um, I would have followed the same. I would have done the same as you did, where it was it was on you you play on the strong bits, and this is how you get across your rhythm. But when you when you look at it a wee bit more. You start realizing that this then turns into sort of um you know like that uh, like an American sort of the the Travis picking sort of thing where you're not really doing that exactly but you're going um and it's getting it gets repetitive after we went you know so if you're arranging to sort of give this here a bit of rhythmic drive to it. Just forget about it all completely. Don't worry about like the strong notes and stuff like that there because that will come out in the melody, okay? You know, the, I remember the, um, the accompaniment or the guitar, it doesn't, nobody cares about it. It's the melody that people want. And if you 
so you can get across the rhythm in your melody rather than relying on the bass strings to do it. Um, that will bring on arrangements an awful lot. Okay, so um, and just let me look at the tab here to see if I do that. Um, yeah, so there's there's bits where that does happen, but this brings us nicely into the second part of into the second part of the song. This is our sorry into bars three and four. Um, that's uh, you're right. It may, whenever I'm playing this here, it does start off and that you're playing uh, sort of on one and then on beat four, and that's where your bass notes are coming in. Um, mm. See there, this is when the syncopation stuff that I'm talking about comes in. So. Uh, the way the melody goes there is something like this here. Um, we have this long note happen, okay? Um, which is, you know, that's a rhythm that you find an awful lot of jigs where it's going, you know, crotchet, quaver, crotchet, quaver, okay? Mm -hmm. whenever, I was, whenever I was doing the song, I was finding this just isn't driving the rhythm at all at all. It just, it stops it dead. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of contradicting myself now as well, which I'm saying don't let the accompaniment be your, just don't rely on the accompaniment for your rhythm, but this is a bit where I did. Um, the, what I did then was that I put the bass notes and sort of the, the beat in between that crash and quaver, okay? Which is great because you're not really, again, it's not particularly complicated, you know, it's, if anything, it's, it's, if you gave it to a music teacher or something like that, they'd probably say, why would you do that there instead of varying the rhythm? But your ear starts, you know, you're, whenever you're listening to stuff, your ear picks up on stuff different than you would think whenever you're looking at it on, uh, on the stage. On paper. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and there, there we have this here sort of then It's literally just going like, instead of going like this, it's going. Okay. Still holding the same rhythm, mm -hmm. the melody, except you're filling in that blank with the bass notes. And because those, you know, your brain is sort of going, all right, these low notes, the bass notes, your brain's going, oh, that's nice and syncopated, so it is. Okay. Taking mm. it its own. That's interesting, actually, syncopated bass notes in like a bass note on the second quaver. Yeah. It's, uh, that's very unusual. <laughs> isn't it? Isn't it? But it doesn't sound so out there in that it's like your ear picks up and goes, that's not the Russian music. Uh, or mm. just, that's just weird. Your, your ear doesn't pick no, up. Yeah, no, not at all. It does, it, does, it, it fits in. Um, the, um, for rhythm in general, I'm looking, this is a bad piece for me to be talking about not playing on the one and three because or one and the four because I'm looking through it and I've done that an awful lot. But uh, the, um, that's the gist of it, okay? And that's sort of the height of techniques that I'm looking at in this here. Um, I'll, um, I'll send you on the tablature for this so you can stick it in the description so people can watch along at home. Yeah, great. But just you got, do, you have, um, do, you, do you have like a, an arrangement book or anything like that? Or do you release tabs or? Um, either I've, uh, under most of my videos, or somebody asked, I have a big selection of folders and you could drive if people want them just um, for any of my tunes, just ask in the comments or send me a buzz on Facebook and I'd send you the link to them. Um, Brilliant. All right. Oh, I'll, I'll yeah. stick some links on for that then. Yeah. Good stuff. Thank you. Um, so just to sort of wrap up the A section, because we've sort of covered all the techniques in this here. Um, bars, so um, bars three and four is where we have the syncopated thing in the bass happening. Um, bar, uh, um, bars one and two, uh, to mess up the order of this, bars one and two is where we have this tapping thing that it was on about happening, where we're going. Um, where, where we're adding a bit of variation to the melody by adding tapping in rather than just playing it straight in the same strength. Yeah, um, that's really but, nice, that, that sort of tap chord effect is great. Yeah, and you know, it's, it becomes sort of like a feature of the arrangement, if you know what I mean. Like, it's, it's something that the ear picks up on and goes, oh, Wheelan's also, that's the one where the tapping thing happens. Or that's how I remember it for whenever yeah. I have to play it, you know. Um, yeah. But uh, then bar, um, bars five and six is the same sort of gist, except the tapping is now happening in this rhythmic effect and more for an uh, um, efficiency thing where we're going. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah. So the, we, we still have that there sort of thing with the, um, 
that thing with the D string happening. Uh, but then after that, there we have this. And then rather than being less efficient by going, you know, playing it with our fingers, I just play the open string there, tap on with the, the ring finger for the F sharp, and then play that one. So we can play it really fast and go. Keep the speed. Makes ah, like nice. Um, yeah. you know, if, if you want it to be pernickety, you could say that's an extra technique, but in reality, it's just us being lazy and uh, making life easier for ourselves. Okay. <laughs> Um, I, I suspect that's the thing with a lot of great guitarists, isn't it? A lot of these kind of unique techniques that you find probably started out as ways to avoid doing something hard, like you know. Yeah, that's like you're sitting. Was it you're sitting up at half two in the morning, thinking I can't play this. I've been sitting practicing this. I need it done to record this video tomorrow. Um, <laughs> I just do what's easiest. You know, that's usually the way these things uh, come about. <laughs> um, so then, uh, then to cover the last two parts. So I was talking about this rhythm. Um, um, that sort of breaks up the flow of the piece. Now that we're getting to bar seven and eight, um, that comes up again where we have the rhythm going. Because we're coming to the end of the section, you can get away with just playing it like that there. It sort of it tells the listener that, all right, this is the end of this year's section, okay? Um, that, um, that little chord movement that you've done there, the, um, what is it? Like that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, that's that really useful little bass run shape from yeah. the Dad Cat video again, it's, isn't it? That's yeah, it's, sliding yeah, along. yeah uh, exactly. And this is where um, I was looking at the melody for this year and was going, all right, this is really handy. This is just what I would play when I'm accompanying it anyway, you know? Yeah. And, you know, like a big thing about guitar in general and music in general is sort of finding these weak links that you can use to put into anything, okay? So, like, um, if I'm accompanying a song that, you know, isn't particularly traditional, I still have my chord shifts, my runs that will, you know, that let me sort of put it into my own style, in inverted commas. Um, and so you can just, you, you, it's tying all these things together and that, that's this is... It's just how you make, this is how you get better and sort of do all this stuff. It's more fighting links than anything, okay? Um, but anyway, uh, and then the last bar is just standard triplet. Um, oh, a lot of the triplets in this here are in on this low D string, which if it were Tony McManus playing, he would be using his thumb. Um, but this is where, you know, I'm sort of just using the fingers out of laziness again. Uh, let's move on to the section. Um, so... We've covered the A bit, and um, again, this is where, like, when we're looking at the B section, this is where stuff can um, fall apart in an arrangement, because we've, we've done the A section, we've done the A arrangement, and we're going, right, this is 100%. And we get to the B part, realise that bits of the melody are too, that bits of the melody are just, you know, way up there, away all over the place. We can't figure out how to do it, and we're going, oh, God, no. This is very luckily not a tune that does that. And if it was, I think it would have cried because this was a very last minute area <laughs> in my part. Um, there's bits in this year, there's bits in this year B section where it'll not really come across in the way that we're doing it, but there's bits in this year where there's bars that the melody is actually the same as a tune as a tune previous in the set called Sadie's Jig. Um, so I just I literally just rip bars from that there and put it into the Cedar. Um Again, laziness. If you wanted to be, if you were saying this, <laughs> to, uh, yeah, if you're saying this to somebody that you're trying to impress, you could say it's a thematic thing of the arrangement or something like that. You know, but um, here is where my point from earlier on sort of comes into play a wee bit more um, about the rhythmic thing. Um, mm -hmm. Not playing on one and one and four. Um, the A section was a horrible example for that there because I just did that throughout the whole thing. Um, but here, um, I try not to. So I'll just play through the B section first. Okay. It's been a long time since I played this tune, as you can tell.
talk about this into the B session. It'll be helpful if you're if you're listening along and want to follow along. With this do get the top of up for this part because um, you can see it more easier and not there than me trying to explain it. And um, we have rhythms that you'll find six eight tunes um, from you know six eight pieces from like um, the classical repertoire, or jazz repertoire, or whatever. Um, and you'll find rhythms this year that are simple. Um, there's no like no uh, massive like double dotted stuff or anything that's really weird, but putting it into trad makes it really handy. So if we look at bar one, um, one and two as an example, um, mm. this is the way the melody goes. So I'll play through it slowly. In the first bar, we're just letting that note ring out. Um, the 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 D in the bass. And then moving to the second bar, we're doing this. Uh, we have this syncopated thing happening where it's coming in like a beat early. Okay, so it's called the F sharp, or sorry, the G to the F sharp. That's happening on beats one and beat three instead of beat one and beat four, which would be what you would do, what would you you would sort of expect, you know? No. Yeah. This actually ends up adding more movement to the piece than it would if we were just going. Uh, Something like that there. Okay. Mm. Um, this is another example, I think, as well, where I sort of missed out a note, or I didn't play a note because we've got something happening in the bass line that covers it up, you know? It's um, in the space line. Yeah, and that's, the, that's a fantastic way of thinking about it. That's what it does. It just it fills it in. You don't always need to be... Uh, you don't always need that. You know, you don't always need to play every note in the melody if you can fill it in with something that works Yeah. Well. Okay. Just, just yeah. as a general principle, um, especially for jigs, I, I, I mean, generally, would you say it's best to have all the quavers filled with something? Like if there's no melody note or it's a long melody note, put a bass move there to kind of flesh you know, that out and keep the rhythm running. Um, I think generally to think about that is, um, I would say no. But I don't really mean no at the same time. Let me explain this here. So, um, <laughs> I this <Maybe>. this <laughs> this is another thing that um, that sort of brought me down whenever I was to start out in ranging as well. Um, you started thinking that you need everything to be happening. You need something to be happening at every beat of this tune, or you need something that will just you know you, the the viewer lose interest or something like that. There. But uh, what is it? The saying is that music is notes and silences, and sometimes those silences is what brings it out. Those rests are what actually brings out a tune. Okay, so if we're let's say we're arranging a piece, and um, you know we want we uh, we make it very uh, we make it very active in the bass. We have something happening um, at every beat of the bar, um, because there's always something happening in the tune. It it gets boring after we wait. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, sometimes just letting a tune ring out on its own rather than having to have it accompanied by something always is the best way to do it. There's a slip jig that I do, um, just to come off with Lindsay Old South for a wee bit. Um, there's a slip jig I do called the Fisherman Statty Punch, um, which is just one of those random tunes that, you know, you're searching through the session someday and find it, and it turns out that it's like, it's some old arrangement from 15 years ago that nobody plays because it was just randomly put up uh, as a bet or something like that there, you know? But it's actually a really nice melody, you know, something like this. Nice, unusual. Yeah, you can just let it ring out. The big feature of that piece is, is that you have um, you have like uh, two quavers tied over the bar line between bar one and bar two. Mm. See ya. Yeah. That's a case where like don't have don't don't be having this thing where you always have to have a quaver happen and don't have that then do the thing with, or don't have that block that bit out of the melody. Okay. Um, or if you do, if you, if you still do want to have a bit of happen, now do something that's subtle, okay? Add a harmony note or something rather than thinking about a bass thing, okay? Um, I've 
you know, so in short, um, sometimes it's handy to have something happen at every quaver. Sometimes it isn't. Use your ear and sort of use your not use your common sense to sort of figure it out. Does that answer the question at all? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Good stuff. Use your ears is the is the key takeaway from yeah. that, isn't it? Really? Yeah, that's, if you know, it's, it's a good idea, then it is a good idea, you know, regardless yeah. of whether you really understand yeah. why it is. Yeah, yeah. You know. and you know, that, and that, goes for, that goes for like just arranging or doing anything musical in general. If it sounds nice to your ear, it will most likely sound nice to somebody else. And sure, if it doesn't, who cares anyway, at least you like it, you know? Yeah. Um, so anyway, back to the section this year. So we've talked about this here not having our rhythm on beats one and four. Um, this syncopation adds in... The same is the right word, wouldn't it be? Yeah, yeah, sync. Yeah, if it if the if you've um, put a, a dominant beat on an off beat or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, you can tell I did music day level, can't you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, my music teacher. Was I only did I only did half of it, so. Uh, <laughs> <beating me. laughs> um, so. Uh, yeah, adding the syncopation adds more rhythm to it than just having it in one and four all the time because you're giving a bit of variation to the ear. Okay. Um, if you can get it so that the melody is also keeping the rhythm as well, this syncopation just it, like it just it makes for a really strong, really tight arrangement. Okay, um, the there's also times where it can you can do the syncopation stuff, and I know myself because there's arrangements that I've done with them uh, where you can sort of take the neck with it a wee bit too much, and you can go, oh, this is really nice here. This, this there's oh, let's let's pop this and beat two out of beat seven in this uh, this seven eight stream that we're doing. And then you listen back to it and you're going, it sounded good in your head, but do you still really want to go on with that? And most of the times I just say yes, because it can be valid at the game. And well, that's a valid question. But um, anyway, um, again, it's just another case of using your ear. Okay? Try your best to avoid keeping it on one and four as a rule. Because once you sort of mm. say, right, I don't need to do that anymore, this is when you start coming up with these interesting rhythms and stuff. Okay. One thing I find generally with these, with those kinds of um, things where you've, if you've chosen to move the dominant beat one quaver too early, for example, yeah. which is the thing people always do in, in D major, they'll go, da da you know, so they're, yeah. they're putting in that F sharp minor chord, a beat before, uh, a quaver before the start of the bar. da 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 going into yeah. G. Kind of thing um yes. but i find like it sounds really good um but you can't if you do it once at the start of a section you've kind of got to do it again otherwise a lot of the time anyway you know if you if you add a sort of feature and then you get yeah. rid of it straight away or do a different one it gets a bit confusing i find yeah um hmm, that's an interesting point um i could do I don't know if I would necessarily agree with you, but I think this is more just a personal taste thing than anything. Um, yeah. I remember there was a workshop that Ed Boyd, you know the guitarist out of Fluke? Yeah. Um, he did a workshop at um, a festival called Fiddler's Green um, in Restrever, which is local to here once. And his big thing was sort of trying to get a variation to your playing by adding in this syncopation. So if you add it, if, you know, if you're, let's say we're accompanying something and we go... Um, Just I think that's our just happening on you know one and four or on the where the strong beat should be. Um, mm. I use this incantation as variation, maybe rather than rather than thinking about it as you have to have this idea going. Um, I don't think that you do. Um, I think varying up the rhythm is um, a good way to sort of. Like uh, very up your company rather than thinking about varying up chords, um, and even if you do have that there's syncopation thing happening in it, where you know you're that the you uh, D slash F sharp or F sharp minor or whatever one you're playing, um, even if you do play that, you know on beat like a uh, beat five and six of a jig or something like that, there, um, I don't think you necessarily need to do it every time over to um, to do something like that there. I don't know. That's my opinion, anyway. But uh, yeah, I, no, I, I, it's uh, it's interesting that <laughs> it's interesting that you say as well to like keeping the chords the same and changing the rhythm is uh, well. They're both good options, aren't they? You know, you can do you can yeah. do a bit of both. And, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, I could sit and talk about a company all day, which is bad because I don't know enough. I don't know enough about the company to be doing that. But um, uh, I know it. Uh, no, I can start talking about it. The company that we need on. So um, let's we'll, we'll move back to this here. Uh, so we've covered bars one and two, where um, and we're talking about this not putting the rhythm on the beat. Um, and then the rest of the bars are just sort of following a pretty simple approach to uh, doing all this here. Um, bars three and four is, you know, it's just pretty standard. Um, again, this uh, one and four thing, it happens in bar four. Um, you know, that there's, um, that's just one and four. There's nothing really complicated happening there. It's just standard finger style stuff. And um, one thing you could say is that we've now introduced this B minor into it that we haven't heard before. But yeah, and again, that's something that you find in, you know, uh, that you're going to the B section of a tune. Um, usually you can vary it by just going up to the B minor at the start rather than the D because it's a relative minor. So I think you've covered that. Yeah. I have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Muffled about that or something. <laughs> uh, Regular I'm, viewers have definitely got, got that really. <laughs> the starts with B sections now. That's the, uh, yeah. <laughs> it is and that is that's like the first variation that you learn whenever you're accompanying that's the first thing i teach my students is make yourself look far better than you actually are but just sticking a b minor somewhere where there's supposed to be a d and if somebody looks mm. at you just pretend that you didn't see them but um <laughs> the so yeah that's um that's being introduced there and um, perhaps a g chord would be a better fit there um you could play G major seven, um, just thinking about the uh, varying chords and stuff. If you could figure out to way make that chord working, mm. and the uh, confusing your, you know, confusing your fingers too much, um, maybe that would be a nice variation. Um, but that's not one that I would do. Now, um, bars, uh, bars, uh, sorry, bars five and six of the B section is where this taking the mic with the syncopation thing sort of comes in. Um, how effective this is, I don't know, but um, I, I'll see if you can hear it anyway. I'll go from the start. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, there, there's the two bars there where it's completely different rhythmically for the yeah. moment. Yeah. Yeah. The, in bar in bar five of the B section, the the D note does not come in with the top D as you would expect it to. It comes in on B two. Why I don't particularly know. I'm not going to lie. I, this is just one of those things where you go, this makes sound nice, and then you forget about it, come back, and suddenly it's a part of the arrangement. Um, do I like it? I think it do. It's this syncopation stuff. It brings. It just it gives that wee bit of lift to it. Um, if that D fell on the start of that there bar, you know, that's that's a hundred percent. That's grand. But putting it on big two, it just it's it's just it's something unexpected and it gives that wee bit of jive to it, you know? Yeah. Um and uh, the if again if you look on the stave, this is where it'll be easier to see than the explaining it. But the the rhythm there is a quaver and then a crotchet, tied into a quaver and then a crotchet, which is a uh, pretty interesting rhythm, uh, I would think, um, especially for traditional music. You sort of you've displaced it, sort of by moving it over one. Um, I suppose you could say that's like that's more of a Scottish rhythm than a, than an Irish rhythm, that isn't it? It's uh, like a Scotch snap. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, no, that would be a Scotch snap. Yeah, that's uh, that's exactly what it'd be called. Um, yeah, and you know, sticking all this here stuff in it, like scotch snaps as well, like putting those out into your bass lines is really handy because it's, you know you've, you've got that offbeat thing happening, but it's not so offbeat that it sounds off. Um, excuse the wordplay, but um, yeah, all right. So this is so that sort of covers the rhythm and the basses and um, how that can sort of tighten up your arrangement and give you a bit of rhythm while not making just falling on one and four. Okay. Um, I suppose the next thing to think about then after that is harmony, um, which whenever you're playing these fast tunes, is hard to come by because it's difficult enough to be playing, you know, playing a tune to that um, session speed and then have to be putting in like your major thirds and stuff in it as well. And sort of the way that I used to get around it, and uh, again, this is one of the things that I'm working on, so go look up Tony McManus' videos if you want more information on this here. Um, mm -hmm. 
try using the open strings whenever you can to do it. So the, this happens in bar six of the B part where it goes in. Okay. That there technically is a G major neck. There's no third or fifth. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, that third happen thing happens as well for um, efficiency sake. Um, that G major nine, like if you if you play it on its own, or if you play it properly, more like a, what would it be? Something like this. Um, that would be tricky enough to sort of to get away with in a session. I would say, you know, you could sit and play it once, but if you played it more than twice, I think you might get an angry fiddle player to shooting you a glance. Um, the oh, do it all the time. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> I, <do well. laughs> I love jazz yeah. chords. It's just sticking me in everywhere. But yeah, any that. excuse. <laughs> That's it. No. Um, but um, the because we're playing at speed, and yeah, you sort of it's it's less of a feature, more just something that happens. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let's let me play this at speed really quick for you. You shouldn't really pick it up, but it does give you something, and you can say that it's there. Um, playing, you know, playing it just on its own without those there that uh, um, added extra G and A string, and it, it does sound a wee bit um, a wee bit bare at that point. Then, uh, let me go from here compared to. Um, You know, it's, it's, again, it's something that, you know, it probably if you left it out, it doesn't really matter because most people will be able to pick up on it, but it just, it, it adds something to it and you can say that it's there. Yeah. I was going to ask you about this. What's your take on uh, jazz chords in folk music and the kind of more, more extended harmony within fingerstyle? Because it's, Dadgad doesn't really lend itself actually very well to more extended harmony just because of the way that the notes are laid out. I, th I tend to find anyway, it's quite difficult to, um, to find those things deliberately, apart unless it's like adding notes that are already open strings, which yeah, obviously harmonised. Yeah, I get where you're coming from, and I can see why you think that there. But if you look into it, like there, it's not that tricky to sort of stick extensions in that work in track. Now, I would never go to a jazz band and try to accompany a dad yet, because uh, you know I don't hit myself that much. But um, the you can, you know, major sevens, your added nines, um, your, your dominant sevens and your minor sevens, of course, your diminished chords as well. And um, you can all get those quite easily, actually, with shapes and dark. So, for example, this is a, you know, this is your G major nine. And um, C sharp diminished, which is the substitutes for your five seven. Um, yeah. Uh, what other ones is it? You know, you can get your flat seven chords as well, um, like a... Uh, There's uh, an arrangement of my channel of a song called uh, The Queen of Archive, which I got off a band called Gitche, but it was originally by a Scottish group called Silly Wizard, um, mm. where I use an awful lot of like jazz substitution and stuff in parts of it. So if I'm not sing for you on camera, but I try and remember it, you know, like this here chord. Um, what's that? That's like a D, sad, D. Or would be D down with 11 or something like that, would it be? Um, D uh, C and a G. Yeah, it's a D11, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, that's a pretty jazzy chord. And again, that is a pretty jazzy chord, yeah. Well, it's not that tricky of a finger, and like you can, you know, oh, this is just adding your pinky finger onto a D, um, D7 shape. This is mm. not. But there's E. Oh, that's nice. Um, I use that there when, uh, whenever, I, um, whenever I've had a few pints in me and start trying to put jazz into stuff. Um, you know, <laughs> I, you know, I got tritone substitution, so you can, if in the key of D, you can sub out an A7 for an E flat 7. Mm -hmm. um, I just use this here to be cheeky. So we're solving mm. there. Um, you still have, you know, again, fairly complicated chord. Uh, e flat, like, was it E flat add to add? Sharp eleven, something later seven. 
I don't, know, like that. I don't know what it's called, but it sounds nice to me. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's not, you know, you, you, my, you, my ears are good, <laughs> they're not that good. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a very nice uh, chord. Yeah, nice so it's, it's, you know, and it's lovely, and you can stick that there, like in Niner Tunes as well. There's uh, a John Doyle one that I'm working on at the moment, which mm. is the False Lady or something like that, where I've managed to sort of. I have still still in the process of sort of figuring that one out, but you know, that word it gives you it, there's a nice resolve to it, I find anyway. Again, mm. do not go up to Donny Gall and play that chord in the session. You know, read the crowd whenever you're buttoning all these jazzy stuff. Um if you were to I don't know, if you there was a session in the FLA, I remember um last year, I think it was, where it was, you know, it was all very old people on their box accordions, a few fiddles, um and by God, I did not put in a single jazz chord, not there for fear of death. Okay. <laughs> but if, you're play, if, you're, if you're playing with people who'd be more open to that there, then yeah. Um, the, the big thing about guitar, again, nobody cares about the accompaniment. So play in a way that uh, complements the tune rather than just sort of putting a jazz chord in for the sake of it. Um, it's mm. very critical of me to be saying this here because I usually put in a jazz chord for the sake of it but it's yeah not, you know do well, this is the thing i think jazz chords often do complement the tune and i think i mean i think there's i think there's room for both because i think a lot of the kind of magic of irish music the thing that makes it so sort of emotionally powerful in if you like is is its kind of harmonic simplicity and the fact that compared to, compared to um other sorts of like western european folk music it's not really being influenced by um, functional harmony very much at all, I don't think. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, no, I, I can see for various historical that. reasons, I imagine. Um, but so, so like, if you've got, you never really have a bar where it very much sounds like it has to be, um, I don't know, a, a chord yeah. two instead of a yeah. chord four. You know, there's no, there's, there's yeah. no difference between those two really rarely anyway occasionally you might yeah. get a little mini arpeggio or something but not very often yeah and, and that's kind of yeah sorry you carry on well that's kind of that's kind of part of its whole thing that makes it so i saw a thread on reddit actually recently someone was like why is it that irish music is all kind of wistful and bittersweet and i was like well it's <laughs> i think it's that i think it's the fact that it's not very definite about what the harmony should be and it's always yeah. open to interpretation but then when you're adding sort of inoffensive extensions like major ninths and things like that, I think that can be complimented. Yeah. You know, I, yeah, I don't know, see that there should be a, a, a sort of war between the traditional sound and the, the odd, the odd cheeky yeah. extension here. You know, I could, yeah, that's, that's also yeah. part of what makes Dadgad sound, sound so good. The yeah. having the extra, um, the D and the, and the, and the A ringing out in all the chords at the top there, isn't it? So, yeah. You know, the, the, there was like your standard dad dad chord, like this here one, which I would play in a session. That's an ad, yeah. so it is. You know, you don't think of it as an ad nine, but it is. Um, and it works, yeah. just, you know, if you think about it, it's just the A and the D is just the dominant on the root of the, or sorry, the A and, yeah, the D and the A is just the root and the dominant of the, um, of the tune. And like for 90% of the tunes, you could have that drone happening underneath it and nobody would bat an eye, you know. Um, so adding those there, those two chords can you use to set nice. And again, this here one, so, uh, you know, like that's got a big uh, fat 30 minor second up the top. But people mm. play that as an A7 in the session and people won't mind. Yeah. You know? uh, so I can see where you're coming from on that there. Now, the, the, I think the whole thing about there's not, there's certain chords that fit here. Um, they are, sorry, saying that there doesn't have to be certain chords. Um, like a, this bar and this tune does not always have to be a G it could be something else I would be inclined mm. to agree with for that but I know that there's there's also another philosophy playing guitar or playing or accompanying tunes in that there is a set chord for here um, and it should be this here one um, do not substitute it uh, which is more effective I don't know again personal taste I would say I would be inclined to be more jazzy than mine mostly because I've not been in trad as long as perhaps other people would, um, but the I would have played in jazz bands and stuff in school, um, and there's mm. other jazz as well. So that might be what influences me. But you know, there's I don't think there's a right answer or a wrong answer. It's more just mm. when what your uh, who your company prefers. Mm -hmm. Is is there a kind of uh, a contingent then in 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 sessions perhaps like around where you are um, 
that are saying there are kind of right chords for this tune and wrong chords for this tune and no, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say that. And if it came off like that, there, there, that's not. I don't think that's what I meant. It's just. Um, I let it their names out. <laughs> <laughs> and there's. Uh, I've done workshops with people, um, like fantastic guitarists who are far like a hundred percent better than me in the company, and uh, you know they would say that they that certain chords go here in the tune and certain chords go there, and mm. not to be too jazzy with it. And I, you know, you, you can say that, you know, um, I don't particularly agree with that. Like, technically, you're not right. You know, if you've got a bar going A, C sharp, E, you could play that as an A major chord, but you could also play it as an F sharp, um, was it F sharp minor seven? Um, yeah. But then you listen to them play in a company, and at that point, you sure go, you know, I'll just shut up and listen to you, you know? <laughs> and uh, I... I think just keep it tasteful is the main thing of it. Don't go throwing in sharp 13 chords if you can't make it work. Yeah. Uh, jazz for the sake of it is never, uh, I, it's never great. And again, I say all this stuff, but I do it 100% of the time as well. You know, it's just, um, I've been thinking on both sides, I don't think there's a right wrong answer or a wrong answer. And I, don't, I wouldn't say there's a contingent bound here if you say certain chords need to be here and certain chords need to be there. Now, of course, uh, playing an E flat chord where there's supposed to be a D because technically it turns into an E flat sharp 13 or something like that, I perhaps wouldn't go that far into it. I wouldn't go that jazzy. I would try to keep the sort of substitutions that are the basic substitutions that I can remember in my head. Um, yeah. But, you know, are we, are we... When, it, when it comes to anything involving roots, a semitone away, I. Uh, yeah, I, I would avoid that. But occasionally yeah. in minor keys, it's all right. It works okay in minor keys. I don't know. Yeah, you know something. Like semitone either side is always fine as well. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I can, I can see that. Um, I need to look into it more, to be honest. I, my accompaniment has... Oh, excuse me. I added that out. Uh, the, my accompaniment has been taken up the... What is this? Uh, the sort of backside approach uh, compared to my arrangement at the moment. Of course, that need to get... Uh, yeah. But anyway. Anyway, sorry. Sorry. I, uh, I yeah, totally God help you. you. <laughs> God help you editing this here because I'm <laughs> trying to put this in the <laughs> yeah. video. God make it. I think what, uh, what I'll probably end up doing is chopping all the bits where you're talking about the actual arrangement into one section and then yeah. all the bits where I'm asking you something that's completely irrelevant to what you're <laughs> actually talking about into another section. That's, um, that's, a, that's a decent way of doing it. You may, you may oh, crack open a bottle of whiskey or something while you're doing it because Jesus Christ. Uh, <laughs> So um, we were talking about harmony, um, and we did this here. The, you know, technically adding in a G um, G major nine, when in reality it's not. You know, it's it's um, you're not really thinking about that. There, you just think like, nice and pretty notes, and it's not really noticeable. But that doesn't really matter either. Okay, and then the last two bars again. Um, it falls back into the rhythm of playing on the four. So. This is where playing in the four does work because we've had all this here syncopation in the bars beforehand and the B part. But now to at the end of it, we've fell back into just playing like reg regular and normal rhythm in the basses. And that brings us to the end of the tune for one and also brings us back to a bit of normality um, before we go into the repeat. Okay, mm -hmm. that's how I think about it anyway. If that, whether or not that really works, I don't know, but I've um, it's done me well so far. So, um, to summarize, in the B section of that tune, um, it's uh, less about talking about these hammer on stuff that, that we were talking about the first tune and efficiency, and more about the rhythm and the basis. So, uh, for to break out of this thing of beats have, or the basses have to happen on beats one and beat four, um, we can change it so that maybe we have a, the uh, bass happen on beats one and then beat three, or we go really level and have our, um, our tonic note happening on beat two rather than on beat one. And after that, that's sort of the height of the tune, um, there's not really an awful lot more to go into. Now, if you want, we can then start going into how years can put this into sort of perhaps a simpler tune. How what, sorry? 
So how um, I know you're saying in our messages that talking about how you can take these techniques and then use them in your own tune or uh, stuff like that. There, do you want to go over that? Yeah, absolutely. That would be great. Yeah, if you've got any um, any top tips for for people at home or any um, kind of more general pointers about how to how to get you know, about writing their own arrangements, that'd be really useful. Yeah. Yeah. the The main thing is sort of. Listen to it first of all. Find a recording of whatever you're playing and really listen to it before going and starting an arrangement. I know that with this here, as well as um, with the rails, with the Mick O'Connors and Lado Burns, um, a set of rails that I did, they're also off this year, Michelle Mulcahy album. And, I've had, and I just had that track on repeat for days, like just listening to it and really absorbing it and going in. And you know, you pick up an awful lot of stuff. So this syncopation thing that I'm talking about in the basis, this a lot of that came from the playing of Michelle McCahy because she does all that there sort of stuff um, with the basis of her heart. And it, it really gives a great effect. But if I didn't sit and listen to that there, I wouldn't pick that up. And again, you know, listening to stuff also helps with figuring out the chords rather than having to sit down and do it all yourself. So for... Um, the first tune in the set, which is called O'Sullivan's March, it goes something like this here. Okay. There's a, there's a syncopated thing happening here where we're going. To. That's following the beat early. Yeah. And that's from the track. That's on the CD, and you know, just from listening to it, that's how I came up with that. If it was me, record, uh, just sitting and recording it, I'd find the sheet music online and said, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit and arrange it. If I hadn't listened to that, that, that probably wouldn't have happened in it. But because I have, that's ended up being like a really, really drivey thing that happens in the um, mm. first part, you know? And it's because of these, it's yeah. through listening to these here things that you start to pick up and stuff and you start to pop them into your own arrangements. Um, learning also just another thing, learning this scale. Where you play across the strings. I think that's the most, you know, that is the most handy thing to learn if you're planning to arrange this stuff because it just, it makes life so much easier for yourself in the long run. Thinking, yeah. rather than thinking about, oh, I have to do a big, there's a big scale from here. How am I going to do it? You know, my fingers can't be fast enough to do I don't like the, you know, something like that. I don't like those sounds. Like, how can I do it? Just pull into that scale. Then what else have we got? Yeah, so there's there's um, aspects to the percussion that I didn't really cover here because they weren't, I didn't use them in that way in those side. But um, I'll just, I'll go over them real quick. There's one which is called frailing, which is like what they do on the claw hammer banjo, okay, where instead of plucking the string like this, we're sort of flicking it like this. Sounds fat on the bass notes, doesn't it? It's great. Yeah. Slap um, bass, uh, yeah, and again, the yeah, the, Tony's fantastic at it. He, there's a video he did with PRS where it's just him going up a scale with that there. Thing and it's mm. classic. I still learn it, unfortunately. But you know, that's something that you can use to add a bit of um it gives it a different tone, you know, especially on those other top strings. Yeah. You can hear that difference. Um there's a slip jig that I'm doing at the moment called the fairy jig, um, which she uses up there, which is um Slapping those down. Oh, that's cool. You know, um, and then there's there's the um, slapping with your thumb, which is like in slap bass. Um, I don't really use it all that often. Let's see if. Um, yeah, so there's a tune called Born for Sport, which I do, and I haven't played in ages, so I'm not attempted. But the wee section of the B part where I do that slap goes like this here. So, sorry, more accurately, like this. But just combining the two of them. Oh, that's cool. You know, and these these be oh, 
gong. <laughs> yeah, that took some mental amount of practice to be yet doing it, and I've forgotten how to do it, which shows you how much more I need to do it. Is that, is that like a kind of combined hand movement between a frail and then a slap afterwards, like to jump? Yeah, it's just, it's just it's doing a frail and then quickly moving into the, into the slap, so it's going. It's, um, oh, are you, slap, are you slapping upwards? Uh, yeah, so it's like, um, if we look at it like this here, you can get it on the camera. Um, let's do just slapping it like that, like pushing your thumb and then letting it bounce off so it brings out. Ah, uh, okay. Um, slap bass, you know, the um, slap bass is... Style. Yeah. Yeah, that's all it is. It's just that technique. Um, the frame mm. is a bit trickier. All it is is just, you can't see it in the camera because of this light, but you're rolling your finger up into the ball like you're trying to flex something at somebody, and then you're just doing it on the string. And that's all there is. I'll that's do it on my end because you can actually see my hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's something like that. So it's the, it's the one finger. So the rest of the fingers aren't moving. It's just a ring finger. So if you, ah, right. you want to do this, yeah. Yeah, and then not with the thumb, but like with that part. Oh, God, it might be. That's never uh-huh. right. It was raining yesterday, like nobody's business. Uh, and then just like that bit of it. There. So you, you're, you're doing it from, like, from there, is it? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and just because of the way that your hand is being positioned, um, you know, up here doesn't sound as good. Yeah. But close to the bridge where your hand is usually positioned anyway whenever you're doing this finger style stuff. Far more percussion. Mm. I don't know if you can pick it up on the mic, but... Yeah, that's... Uh, yeah, it's interesting. If, do you ever play with that... Because um, there's, there's one... I did a, a, a book of arrangements recently where I basically tried to make them and they're, they're completely non-traditional, pretty much. <laughs> um, <laughs> so they're, because I'm, I'm, I'm just, in fairness, I'm really not a fingerstyle player, you know, but I, yeah. I thought I'd have a go at doing some jazzy arrangements of tunes That's that good. I like just yeah. to see if I could do it. Um, so, but um, in, the, in one of them, I tried to do a, a claw hammer style one just to see if it yeah. could be done with a polka. Um, and it for that, I, uh, there's there's a sort of the technique that I used in it is kind of based around um, uh, this kind of it's that kind of thing. But so it's kind yeah. of like it's kind of like the frail thing. But you're um, as you go downwards, you're doing a palm mute with your nails hitting the strings, and yeah. then you can pick which which finger to extend so that you hit the right string for the tune on the way back up. You know what I mean? Yeah, do that again for me there. Uh, sorry? Do that there again for me there, just so I can see what you're doing. Uh, just, That's very interesting. Just, it, just, the, just the picking part is kind of like... Oh, good, yeah. Yeah. Um, Kind of I do that, yeah, I do that for songs, not for like less traditional songs, but like for pop songs and stuff, then I, whenever I was starting, I started off playing guitar in general, not trap, just guitar, fingerstyle stuff. I was very interested in classical guitar, then mm. that sort of melded into this here. Um, but I couldn't use a pick, so I'd be sitting trying to get gigs and stuff, and was like, I can't use a pick to strum stuff, so, you know, I don't know if that's the same sort of thing that you're doing. Yeah, it's, it's the same kind of thing. It's the yeah. Um, I think I think I've I've I'm not putting that Newton thing that you're doing, which is quite nice. Um, I have to sit down and practice that. But um, yeah, I use that for songs. Um, I don't think there's any traveling to do. I don't think there is. But no, yeah, that's really handy. It's really interesting to see how you did the poker with that there. To see what? Sorry. So it's to see you playing the poker, not their style. I think that that'd be interesting. Could you do it? Yeah. Well, it. It worked. It worked fairly well. It's the thing with it. I was trying to find a, a way to pick it that sounded percussive at speed because polkas are so fast that I, yeah. my right hand is not very very quick generally. So I kind of was just trying to find a way that I could do the notes and the rhythm faster. Yeah. Um, so through that, a combination of that and hammer-ons, I think it worked out okay. Um, I can't actually play you the thing because I'm in <laughs> dad gad now. But <laughs> oh, yeah. no, that's deadly. Yeah. Um, it sounds very good. Yeah. Cool. Um, that's definitely something. Uh, I know that Steve Bowman um, is a big claw hammer guitar player, and Molly Tuttle as well, the bluegrass guitarist. 
she has a course on playing clawhammer guitar. Um, All I, right. I love clawhammer banjo. I have, I bought a five string banjo. I'm sure you know. You ah, have nice. Been saying I'm going to learn this year, and then it's just black and dust whenever you have to actually, whenever you have to actually sit down and do it. But no, I'm very <laughs> interested in the style. It's class. I think it's class. It's certainly something you can yeah. do stuff and it's, it's great. It's, that rhythm is uh, is un- unstoppable, isn't it? You know. So. I know. I I know that. So I'd be a big fan of it now. Um, yeah. No, I don't. Uh, I wouldn't use that. I wouldn't use that uh, myself. But um, no, it's very interesting. It's definitely very interesting. Um, I'd say keep on going with that. There, see what you can come up with for because that's because no. Yeah, one... I've been meaning to actually try and perfect it for yeah for more general use. You know, because it's yeah. it's definitely cool. And once you get your head around it, I'm sure it's got more scope than the limited the one limited thing that I did with it. Like <laughs> definitely, definitely. But yeah, no, that's mm-hmm. definitely. Oh, there's just one other thing I'd quite like to know what you think about. If you're using, let's say you were arranging a tune in A, mm-hmm. is your kind of first um, approach to that to revert to a more A suited tuning or move the capo or or think it about was... shapes that you can, can use in? Yeah. Hmm. Let me think about this for a second. So I think that's a case where you. Uh, where you sort of think about the tuning that you're in before, um, before sort of looking for tempo changes. So, um, me personally, I always try to avoid having my tempo any higher than the fifth fret and going up to the seventh fret. I just don't like. Surely, because you're at that point, you may as well just get a mandolin. You know, if you, you, you're that kind of guitar <laughs> now, you know, um, fifth fret yeah. again. I did just I, I did an arrangement of a fluke set, the root arity set. And it's in G, um, I think it is anyway. Um, and at that point, I was just like, you know, fifth capo, I'll take it, but I would much rather just take the whole guitar, tune it up a step, and then go to the third, you know, or put the tune down a step, mm. go to the third fret. But if you had to do something in A, um, for tunes, this would be a case where I used the G sus 4 tuning. Okay, so um, it's not an A, but there's a tune in B flat. Let me just. But you can cut this out and just well actually no, I'll show you how to go from that cat to this tune. And um, so all it is is just we're taking this lower D string, putting it down to C, see if that's a tune later on. Um, the A goes down to a G. Uh, and then our A string goes up to C, which is the scary. When you hear that horrible ding, 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 ping noise in a minute, isn't it? Yeah. There you go. Safe for now. Yeah. So this uh, this tuning is really suited for playing in G, um, and it was there's a slow air. It's called Wee John O'Connor's. Oh, not slow air. Sorry, it's like a slow rail or an air. Just um, it's called Wee John O'Connor's, and it's from a uh, Piper um, up around Northern Ireland called Chris McMullen. And it's in B flat. So rather than oh. staying in dab dab and going all the way up to uh, yeah. the eighth fret, I stuck it into this here G sus four tuning. Um and just stuck the cap on the third fret. Um this is really handy because this 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 tuning, if you remember, is just dab gap but shifted up a string. So it's, um, mm. it's like we cut all of them and then just move them up a space. Um and that's really handy because then you can you can sort of just play this here and that guy if you act, adapted a wee bit about to play in D. Um which you know if you're out if you're out playing a gig or something and don't want to uh, retune, just uh, you have to play a new tune, you don't want to retune, you can just sort of you know well, that's, off of Yeah. That's another thing I was I was thinking mm-hmm. because you play arrangements in quite a few tunings. You know, having to retune your guitar all the time. What do you do about that? Do you, do you have two guitars, or are you uh, no, you just do half a set in one tuning and the other half in the other? Or? <laughs> I wish I had two guitars. I don't. I I do an awful lot more teaching than I would actually gigging. But um, ah yeah, on the few that I do, um, there was one. I'll never forget. There was one up in Derry um, that I did. Um, there was for a, a youth group up there, and uh, you know I was just playing fingers like guitar. I it was going grand. Um, and I had picked a tune, so I, I had done an arrangement of a very nice piece of music from a Halo game called The Ferns for Darkness, um, which, like, 
uh, on its own is just a gorgeous piece of music. Uh, it's by Marty O'Donnell. And I had done an arrangement of that. However, the tuning for this arrangement is D flat, A flat, D, G, B, E flat. <laughs> Which you don't even Why need, is <laughs> Yeah, you don't even need me to say anything. Just just hearing that <laughs> is awful. Um, and the I that was just that was just a case where I sort of needed a what is it I had that's a piece in A flat and uh, yeah. I just, you know I showed it to my guitar teacher later because I wanted to see you know could I use this arrangement for my diploma rather than learn something else and he said yeah but why did you play it in A flat with Eddie Capital and not just play it in A and I was it was at that point that I realised yeah isn't it oh yeah <laughs> but. Uh, the arrangement came out nice. <laughs> the tuning is awful. It is awful to play. The stretches are mental. You can it's on my channel. It's it's you, you can look it up if you want to hear it because I haven't played it in ages. But I'll st I'll find a link. I'll put it in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> There's um but yeah, I was playing it at I played it at the gig. And at that point it's just a case of you say to the audience, look, give me twenty minutes here, will you? Or to like twenty minutes is yeah hyperbole, like but yeah. you know you just you just sort of at that point you just sort of try your best to tune as quickly as you can and talk as slowly as you can about the piece beforehand. So it's a case of you know right. So um, I suppose it fills in the gig, doesn't it? Like it does. That's that's what I always joke about, and I go, you know, this is the reason I use so many tunes is because I don't have enough material to fill out a full gig, so I just spend. <laughs> yeah. But um, but no, so um, <laughs> you know, the tunes is just something that you sort of. For trad, at least, instinctually, they start coming to you. So you see a tune and it's an A and you're going, all right, let's give that a go in this here one. You know, this in B flat, this tune goes, goes to something like this. Yeah, I'll just play the first part. It just fits really mm. nice. Can map that tune and, and dad gets lovely, yeah. Same thing. Um, it's a gorgeous sweet piece of music. Um, I have to say, I'll send you the track because it's uh, it'd be nice to see what you did to it. Yeah, if you could, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, but yeah, you know, you, you see a tune in A and you go, all right, maybe it'll work in this here, or you see a tune in G and say, maybe capital fifth fret and the on and dad gal be better than playing it in this tune. And, um, a, a big one that I find quite confusing as well is that. There's sort of two D tunings that you can use for tunes in D. So there's Dad Gad, and then there's C G or C sus two uh, with the cap on the second mm. cap, obviously. Um, and that is just it's the same as this tune, except the D string goes down to a C, and now we find out this D string is going to snap when I tune it down. <laughs> it's days are numbered, so they are. You can just have. <laughs> But you know, and um, so that set of rails and um, the um, what's it called again? Mick O'Connor's. It's a tune that I've been looking to arrange for ages. I, I just love it. I think it's fantastic. Um, and I tried to do it in that yet, but it just wasn't working. You know, it just it just wasn't happening because there's a high B in it, and you were trying to get the accompaniment in it as well. And it's just just you would try your best, and it just it wasn't. It just wouldn't work. So um, no, sorry, ten lights. There's a high A in it. Sorry, not a high B. Um, and you know you're doing oh, right. it. Yeah. And just, it just no, it's not happening. So this tuning is good for whenever you have these higher notes in the in the melody. You know that we didn't so say that we covered. It wasn't you know it wasn't that much of a there wasn't that much of a range to it. You know it's sort of you know you've got your top plus, yeah. you have a top F sharp and that's about the height of it. And that's you know that's really handy for dad yeah. But yeah. maybe you're going up these higher ranges, sometimes it's better to consider this tuning, which with the capo on the notes of it are D, A, D, A, D, E. Okay. You can see how this, uh, yeah. this high E that we have now is really handy for these higher notes. So was, let me try and remember this. Um, and also this is a tune where like the contrast where we were talking about B section being so much higher than the A section. You can really, really tell it in this here tune, so you can. Um, A 
flubs in that one as well. But you know, mm. you can they can tell there the the just through your ear, not even having to look at the notes, you can tell that there is a range difference there that this high E string will just be far handier for. Yeah. Oh, oh that's great. Yeah, interesting. Um, whenever you get into it, <laughs> you what? Sorry, it's very, it's very interesting. Once you, uh, whenever you look into it a bit more, you start seeing the links, and uh, it's, uh, I think it's at that point where um, arranging in general just opens up. Uh, thanks very much for talking to us, Jordan. Um, and just to finish up with, like, where can we? Obviously, you're not gigging at the moment, but where can we find you on the internet if people want to find more of your music? Yeah, so um, I have a YouTube channel called Jordan Lively, um, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you've got a link in the description to it. And then I also have a Facebook page uh, called Jordan Lively Musician, which is where I um, sort of post all my post all my bits and pieces that I do. Um, I'm also um, obviously not gigging at the moment, but uh, I teach fingerstyle guitar and arranging and all that there stuff. So if um, if anybody's interested at all in having a nap around about this, you're going a wee bit more in depth than we did today about arranging tunes or um, anything like that there, um, just throw me a message on Facebook and I will be 100% sure to get back to you um, in no time at all. Nice one. Oh, thank you very much for talking to us, Jordan. And uh, yeah, keep, keep going with the arrangements, man. They're sounding great. Thanks, buddy. Not at all. Anytime, I felt.